Imagine, if you will, a fire that comes from somewhere beyond the beyond. A fire not of this world, one that cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, burn brighter. This is a cosmic fire, a heavenly fire. It's the sort of fire that poets try to catch with words and painters, with their palettes of light and shadow. But both, you might say, are like butterflies chasing the sun. The fire is love, and it is also judgment. And this fire can be found in the book of 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10. Now, nestled into the depths of sacred text, in the heart of the passage we ponder today, there is a whisper of something ineffable, something that defies the confines of our human language. It speaks of a day of such grandeur and awe, a scene of such majesty and terror, that our words tremble and our phrases falter. And yet, even in the face of such ineffable wonders, there is a resonance within you, a realization at the core of your being that responds to the very mention of this divine fire. The passage from 2 Thessalonians 1, 5-10 falls within a letter attributed to the Apostle Paul addressed to the Christian community in Thessalonica. This letter was likely composed around 51-52 AD, a time when the early Christian church was expanding but also facing substantial hardships and persecution. The Thessalonian believers, to whom Paul had previously ministered, were enduring trials and tribulations. These believers were relatively new to the faith, having turned to Christianity not long before Paul's letters were penned. Given their recent conversion, the intensity of their struggles was both a test of faith and a formative period in their spiritual development. Paul's writing served to address several purposes. Firstly, he intended to fortify the young Thessalonian Christians in their resolve, encouraging them to persevere through the afflictions they were facing. The trials they endured were, in Paul's view, a testament to their steadfastness and faith in the wake of opposition and suffering. Such endurance was indicative of the righteous judgment of God and was meant to deem them worthy of the kingdom of God for which they were suffering. The difficulties they faced included social ostracization, economic hardships, and even physical persecution. Paul's message sought to bring comfort and reassurance, reminding the Thessalonians that their struggles were not unnoticed by God and that they were participating in the sufferings of Christ. The world persecuted Jesus Christ, and if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this same world will persecute you, just as these Thessalonians were being persecuted. The truth is, my brothers and sisters, is that you cannot please God and please the world at the same time. It's either you will offend Jesus and please the world, or you will offend the world and please Jesus. Additionally, in this passage, the Apostle Paul addressed the issue of divine justice. He acknowledged that the Thessalonians were being wronged, a common experience for early Christians who often found themselves at odds with both Jewish authorities and Roman law. The sense of injustice and the patience under persecution were prominent themes, and Paul reassured them that God would ultimately judge righteously. He spoke of a future time when God would enact judgment upon those who oppressed the faithful and would bring relief to those who were being persecuted. In speaking of the eschatological end times hope, Paul alluded to the return of Christ, a day when the afflictions of the present would give way to the vindication and glorification of believers. This eschatological perspective was central to the early Christian worldview and offered a horizon of hope for those enduring suffering. It validated their current pain by projecting a future where justice would prevail and God would right the wrongs inflicted upon them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 5 through to 10 which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints 
and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. The choice of words from the Apostle is striking, for he speaks with certainty when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. And this is how we should view this prophetic event. It is a certainty. It is a day that is coming. And this is the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed. Once again, I implore you to focus on the choice of words of the Apostle here. There's a flavor, a nuance to these words that simply cannot be overlooked. This is not the language of literal distances, of the measurable space between stars. It's the language of transformation, the shifting of a veil that has made the Eternal seem distant, when in fact it is closer than our own breath. He does not state that when the Lord Jesus Christ travels from a billion miles away from heaven and arrives here on earth. No. He simply states when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. And that is what this event is. It is a revealing. It is an apocalypse, an uncovering, an unveiling. The Lord Jesus Christ's unveiling is likened to an apocalypse, but not in the sense of a catastrophic end. The word itself, from the Greek apocalypsis, means a revelation, a laying bare. It's the kind of apocalypse that we might describe as the aha moment. For Jesus Christ is here, and he has always been here. He is in another dimension where God and his angels dwell. But that does not mean he is an absent Christ, an aloof Christ, a distant Christ. For he is present here today by his Holy Spirit. And this day the Apostle speaks of is not Jesus traveling from a universe and galaxy light years away from our planet. It is Jesus Christ coming from this other dimension, this other realm, into this world of time and space where he is already present now by his spirit. You and I live. We have life in us. There are seven billion people on this earth and they all live. Angels are alive. Cherubims are alive. But there is no one in this universe that has life like the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. All life comes from Him. When we step into eternity, we will meet Him. And that is our desire. That is what we hunger and thirst for, to meet Him who came to this earth for my sins, to meet Him who was born in Bethlehem, to meet Him who was laid in a manger, to meet him who performed miracles on earth, to him who cast out devils, to meet him who raised the dead, to meet him who healed the sick, who took my sin upon him and died on the cross for me. He was dead and now look, he is alive forever and ever. And he holds the keys of death and Hades. And because he lives, I live. And the Bible tells me that my life is in Christ. Another wonderful aspect about this passage is that we are told about where he will come from and who he will come with. He comes from heaven. And throughout scripture we see men of God who see into this wonderful place called heaven. Isaiah saw into heaven. He saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, with seraphim standing above him. Ezekiel saw into heaven, he witnessed a whirlwind and four living creatures accompanied by wheels within wheels, covered in eyes. Above this was a firmament and a throne, upon which sat a figure with the appearance of a man. Stephen saw into heaven, as he was being stoned, he looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Paul saw into heaven. He described being caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he was not sure. He heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And this is the same heaven Christ comes from.
but he will come along. He will come with mighty angels in flaming fire. Can you imagine this scene? Can you imagine the grandiosity, the pure magnificence, the utter impressiveness of the monumental event Paul is telling us about? Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, surrounded by mighty angels. Angels. Joshua encounters a man who identifies himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. Joshua falls face down to the ground in reverence and is told to remove his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. Daniel sees the vision of an angel who appears as a man and he is frightened and falls on his face, but the angel encourages him to understand the vision. Angels. An angel appears to Zechariah to announce the birth of John the Baptist. Zechariah is troubled and fearful, and the angel tells him not to be afraid. The angel Gabriel visits Mary to tell her she will conceive Jesus. Mary is initially troubled by the greeting, but responds with faith and submission, not fear. John is so overwhelmed by the revelation shown to him that he falls at the feet of the angel to worship, but the angel instructs him not to do so, saying, I am a fellow servant with you. These are holy men and women of God, but when they see God's holy angels, some of them fall as dead, some fear, some are terrified. Now think, think how the whole world will react when they see these holy creatures as far as the eye can see, standing in attendance of the Lord Jesus Christ. This day is truly a terrifying day if you are not a believer. The pure, terrifying nature of this day is highlighted in the first three words of verse 8, in flaming fire. At the start of this sermon, I told you to imagine a fire, and verse 8 is the reason why I told you to imagine a fire. This fire is not merely a physical blaze, nor is it an ordinary earthly combustion. It is a divine fire, an emblem of the Almighty's purity, his righteousness, and his overwhelming glory. It is a fire that purifies, that consumes, that cannot be quenched by human means, for it originates from a source far beyond our mortal grasp. Imagine this fire, this flaming fire that accompanies the Lord's revelation. The brightness of this fire outshines the sun at its zenith. Its radiance eclipses the brilliance of the stars in the host of heaven. This is no destructive wildfire, but a holy conflagration that burns away all pretense, all wickedness, all that stands against the holiness of God. It is the fire of transformation, the fire of judgment, and the fire of revelation that lays bare the secrets of hearts and nations. The world as we know it will indeed be moved by this fire. You may sit there as these words wash over you, with a sense of skepticism, your intellect rising up like a shield against the flame of truth. But deeper, beneath the layers of doubt and the sediment of disbelief, there stirs something ancient, something undeniable, a knowing, a recognition, a consciousness that whispers back in silent acknowledgement of the reality of these things. Your conscience tells you that this day is coming. Your consciousness tells you that these words are true. For this consciousness is what God has placed within you, the fragment of eternity that cannot be extinguished. It recognizes the truth and you can suppress it. However, it is telling you that these things are true. And on this great day, this day of flaming fire and divine revelation, it will resonate with the clarity of a bell struck in the stillness of dawn. To conclude, let us focus on verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 10. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 describes the scene of divine retribution. The mention of taking vengeance refers to the enactment of justice upon those who do not recognize or follow God and his commandments as revealed in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Justice will happen here, for the all-seeing, knowing God will be the judge, the God who cannot be lied to, bought, or cheated. 
You see, in our human courts, sometimes people are handed sentences which are more than what they deserve, and sometimes people are handed sentences which are less than what they deserve. Therefore, justice is not met, but not here. Here, God will give everyone exactly what they deserve, no more and no less. When the scripture talks about the Lord Jesus Christ taking vengeance, it is stating the Lord Jesus Christ will treat people justly. Who exactly is God taking vengeance on? He is taking vengeance on those that know not God. God would not be just if it were not possible to know Him. However, scripture reveals to us that God is a God you can come to know. We see instances where God walks with people, where God becomes their friend, where God fellowships with them. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You can come to know God. Therefore, God is just by exacting vengeance because they have chosen not to know God. For Revelation tells us that Christ is knocking at the door, wanting to fellowship with them. But the truth is, in the world we live in, there are men and women who by choice reject God, although they know Him to be true. There are men and women who by choice choose to turn away from the teachings of Scripture, though they find truth in its words when they are most in need. There are men and women who by choice choose to ignore the call to love their neighbor, though they understand it as a commandment from God. There are men and women who by choice choose to seek their own ends, though they are aware that fulfillment often lies in service to others, as God teaches. There are men and women who by choice choose to silence the inner voice that urges them towards good, though they recognize its whisper as the sound of God's guidance. There are men and women who by choice choose to live a life void of God, though they know He is the one who made them, created and formed them. There are men who by choice choose to love pleasure more than God, though they know in their hearts God is real. There are men and women who by choice choose to live a life in direct rebellion to God, though they know Him to be. Now, can you think of anything more wicked? Anything more wicked than rejecting a God who loves them? A God who has blessed them with the families they love, a God who has given them every single smile they have ever enjoyed. Can you think of anything more wicked than choosing not to know God, yet living on His planet, existing in His universe, breathing His air for free? Can you think of anything more wicked? Therefore, God is just by taking vengeance on those that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not knowing God is a sin, it is a choice. It is a guilty choice a wicked choice. My friends, God is at the door of your heart, and you too can know Him to fellowship with you, to live with you, not just in this world, but forevermore. Open the door. He is speaking to you to get serious with your relationship with God. No one wants you in heaven more than God. After all, He died for you. No one wants you in heaven more than He does. Open the door of your life, and Jesus will come in and will be with you.